amazing. That there we go. Um, that's the most substantive introduction I've ever had. And it's just uh, an honor to have the chance to present um, this work to you. And it's great to be with you. And 7, 7 p.m. for me, I'm in Chicago. So 7 p.m. is a very civilized hour. Um, and uh, thank you for coming. So I I'm. Is it? Is the sharing still working? Can you guys see the screen? Something is a little weird where I, uh, OK. The sharing yeah. is working. It looks to have just a little bit of a delay, but it's working well otherwise. OK, great. So this is this problem. Alex did a great job of anticipating it, You know, this empty shelves problem. Um, I'll give one anecdote. And these stories are, there are journalists that now specialize in writing multiple of these stories every week. So, um, but this is one from the summer. There's a chemical supplier that reports in the US that reports it is behind on 10 times more of its orders than usual. And one thing it does is basically just resell um, a certain chemical. Um, it, can't, it can't get it because the person who, the, the wholesaler that sources the chemical for it is unable to get a key input from a plant in China. Um, even something as simple as metal cans which we don't think of as especially scarce, but their absence can really disrupt this, the a, a whole supply process because the cans have to be shaped in a particular way to go on a particular assembly line. And so if you're missing the particular metal cans you need, even if there's no shortage of metal in the economy, um, you can have cascading disruptions. So there's a lot going on here, which the, business person in question here summarizes as, as being a mess, but this is a paper about some of the uh, theoretical questions that are raised by this, um, these kinds of problems. They're kinds of issues in network theory that I don't think we have good models for. So I come at this as a modeler, but I'm looking at this crisis and thinking, what are some of the issues that we don't yet model well enough? Um, and I'm trying to sort of speak to that. So um, these are anecdotes. I'm not going to focus too much on the um, data side of this because that's not my specialty, but inventories are being drawn down a lot in industries such as manufacturing and construction, which are about putting together things out of complicated physical parts. Um, the, you know, the White House Council of Economic Advisors in the US documented them experiencing a large and it turns out unusual. This is when you compare it to historical data way more than it's ever been in terms of shortage, you know, shortage severity. So what this is, this project is taking those facts and asking certain questions about robustness, which actually Alex laid out already very nicely, um, in a particular kind of production network. So this is a situation where you have many steps, each of them having several essential inputs. And I'm just going to assume for a kind of an illustration, um, these are chosen for alphabetical reasons, um, that there is a, uh, an airplane that we need to make. And we have everything we need for it, except two, two inputs, brakes and computers. And the key thing about these things is that they're, they don't grow on trees. They're also made out of uh, produced inputs that are made by other factories. right? And so I'm going to just illustrate this. So we have a little airplane manufacturer and it needs to rely on brake manufacturers and computer manufacturers for the inputs that it, to, that it needs to uh, produce. And of course, in real life, there's all sorts of other parts that are not here. But let's focus on this simple example. Now, as I mentioned with the metal cans, these parts are custom produced. So it's not just the general availability of computers that an airplane manufacturer is reliant on, but it is the particular computers that are customized for its production. It can't just go to the you know, Walmart or whatever and buy a computer if it's missing. It needs the specific supplier that it has to work. Now, because in any individual supply relationship may be disrupted or experience delays, firms multi-source and have many either actual or potential sources, people they could call up to fill in supply gaps, right? Or at least that's, that should be a possibility we consider. So this project is about that kind of production network where we have, and then when we go from, you know, the brakes are using maybe other things, right? Here we have disks and, and other maybe smaller computers or computer chips that go into the brakes and they also need to be sourced. So this goes on for a while. 
And the questions we want to study in this paper is how robust is such a supply network? Now, there are two kinds of shocks. First of all, any of these given firms and links might be disrupted idiosyncratically, but then there might be things like COVID, and I'll talk more about the shock later, shocks that disrupt, that affect all the links probabilities simultaneously. And one particular mechanism for shocks happening is, uh, well, there are a few. Early on in COVID, it was just that it was harder to do everything. Now, physical production is actually working okay, but, um, and in fact, there's a positive demand shock for goods throughout the world, but there are cues and delays that are caused by and the you know goods piling up at ports. So and also labor shortages, right? So I just read that in in the UK they had to slaughter a bunch of perfectly healthy good pigs um, because there's not enough butchers. So when you have sort of a, a demand shock in some parts of the economy, it can cause waste and delays and, and um, inefficiency in other parts. And so we think that the supply network is being stressed by a bunch of these changes basically that are happening. Now, one criticism you could have of the New York Times narrative that you keep reading or whatever, news, whatever is your favorite newspaper is that even though we are experiencing delays and some supply chain stress or collapse maybe even in some cases, it's not necessarily true that that's a bad thing. It might be that firms invested reasonably robustly in the robustness of their of their supply networks, and we just have a bad shock that you know, unfortunately, a planner also would have been okay with, you know, um, some of these negative consequences. What we're going to find is we're going to analyze these questions. You know, understand how production collapses and and whether it's efficient and what are some of the what is some of the economics of this. Our main finding is going to be the existence of a fragile regime, parameters under which kind of robustly the economy, um, or I should say generically, the economy is in bad shape in the sense that it's sensitive to small systemic shocks to relationship performance. Uh, and what we see as a consequence of that is that many supply networks, which are, which are independent and not dependent, not, not failing because of some common, you know, key input that's missing, for example, they're just independent doing different things, but they're going to be simultaneously failing. And there's, we're going to find perhaps most surprisingly, that firms optimization makes the situation worse, not better, that this is not something that, you know, firms will fix once they re-optimize. It's really something kind of fundamental about um, the economic problem they face um, in this world. And it's inefficient. A planner would never want any of this. So that's the story I want to tell you, but I think, and, and then, you know, methodologically, which is what I get excited about, it touches on issues in random, it touches on new things that we could do in economics with random graph theory and a certain kind of continuum random network, which I'll tell you about, and hopefully you'll find interesting um, for those of you who like methodological stuff, um, find interesting from that perspective. I love questions. I'm, I'm please just unmute, interrupt. I'll also watch the chat, but I'm totally happy with a very informal um, engagement. So he, he, here's a very quick one. Is the example picture to the bottom left just illustrative or is it something that you think you're gonna model later on? So in particular, I see that you want to distinguish between brake manufacturers and computer manufacturers. Should I think of B1, B2 as substitutes among them, C1, C2 substitutes among them, and B's and C's complements from the point exactly. of view of A1? Exactly. This is, the I'm this is the model in a picture. I'll tell you the model in math, but that's exactly the thing, that there's substitutability in your multi-sourcing alternatives and complementarity across many key inputs. And that's that complementarity is absolutely key to the fragility that I'm going to find. Uh, so I'll con you know you could imagine a different process in particular. If you just covered up this whole part of the network, you could imagine you know you focus on sort of one branch here where you're putting things together sequentially, just adding one thing at a time, right? That's an alternative without the complementarity. That's going to turn out to be extremely different, and that's one moral that I'm going to emphasize. But thank you for that great question. Any others? Yeah, Ben. So yeah. Your, your last point is that this is inefficient. So so that suggests there's some type of externality here in the yes. decisions that people are making. 
Is that something you can go elaborate on yeah. more as, we, as you go? I, I will, yeah. So when we get, we'll get to the economic part of, we'll get to the the investment model in 20 minutes. But I, I'll tell you um, upfront what I think is the inefficiency. We're not. There's no complete mark. I'm, I'm not doing this in general equilibrium with complete contingent contracts because what that would mean in this kind of environment is that I can write a contract over, you know, if. F3 is working, but F2 is not working and also seven other things, then you pay me, you know, so we don't have that. What we're going to have is firms can sell their goods at a price um, when they are able to produce them. Um, and they invest in the kind of relational contracts and the various kind of um, soft stuff that makes firms able to be resilient. And there's an inefficient, not a very profound inefficient, the inefficiency is basically that when I invest to make my firm more resilient to crises, I only capture part of the, of the social returns to that increase in robustness because I don't take the whole, the whole rents from the whole supply chain I'm involved in, right? I kind of enable all the production by being more robust, but I can't get all the rents at the margin. And so that's gonna create this wedge. And we're gonna be interested in understanding how the existence of a wedge, which we just assume, um, interacts with the complexity of this network. That's a, but thank you for that question. Um, all right, so. I think the, the, the final oh, one on, on here. Yeah. Will it be the case that we're looking at upstream, downstream supply chains so basically you have a tree-like structure that is acyclical or will you allow cycles of the form, for instance, B1 uh, sources something from C1 and in turn sells some, C1 sells something back to B1. So could I have a cycle yeah. between a B and the C node? Got, or? Yeah, I think I, I, I understand the question. At the macro level, this model allows cycles just like in input output kind of stuff, but it, in, within a given tree, we're gonna assume that all the firms are different. So cycles are not gonna be important. They're, it, it's not a huge deal, but actually they're very interesting as, as of course you've worked on in context of market design, but we're not, we're um, just gonna consider a tree, which is not, um, and actually there's some, there's some work on this by my co-author Matt Elliott with others, where they look for cycles in a very completely measured, um, firm to firm network and they're pretty cycles among firms are, are quite rare cycles among industries are quite common right so that's sort of the the um in an hour talk i'll ask you to forgive me and and because i just can't do the i just can't do the the justice to the literature so i'm going to put this whole slide up at least i can i can at least try to do that um and i'm going to say i'm going to just say two or three words, okay? There's a wonderful literature in macro modeling networks being fragile because some nodes are very important to many things. And when they fail, that, that causes big, big spillovers. A recent literature that is combining, Bakai and Fari did amazing work combining networks and macro ideas, but the quick thing I'll say there is that methodologically, these those guys are macro people. So ultimately they write down models that you can differentiate and they differentiate them. And then they examine how big a deal does this changing this wedge or shocking this TFP, what does that do to GDP? We're much more interested in a more like graph theoretic kind of discrete model, which has a real role for freezes, for things discontinuously working worse than they used to. That's just not what the macro models are really about. Um, it, that's much closer to models for the, this is just for those who, you know, percolation models are very used in network theory. This is just a random smattering of economic applications. And there's, and percolation models are all about some links working or not working. Now you might say that's not, you, you could think, well, how economic is that? Maybe in the real economy, it's not about, you know, it, it's been a very fruitful idea in modeling of information passing. I either tell you a secret or I don't, but you might say in economics, we do prices, we have, it turns out that relationships, there's a, a, a empirical literature documenting that firms really care about their, their suppliers, their friends. If you're, if you're a firm and you're an important supplier is knocked out, you don't just get back up, buy it from someone else. It costs about a quarter for you to, to get your relationships uh, back or, or find substitutes. So we're on a time frame where zero one link functionality really matters to these firms. Okay, so uh, I'm going to um, 
now tell you, uh, in fact, I'm going to skip, I think I'll skip this. Um, I'm going to just jump straight into, um, I'm going to jump straight into the model because I think that's the right thing for this audience. So we have a finite set of, I, I'm now going to put math on the bones of this, of this, um, you know, uh, sketch. So you have a finite set of products, which are like airplanes, brakes, computers, and so forth. Um, there's a continuum of small firms in each of these products. So, and I'm gonna label them by real numbers, like this is actually secretly A.1. So the firm 0.1 in A is one of the many specialized little airplane manufacturers in this economy. Um, that's by design. I don't want there to be, in, in reality, there's actually Airbus, which is like a big chunk of the overall airplane market. But I want to make all these firms small so that any of the failures and non-robustnesses I see are due to something systemic and not to, due to some important firm failing. So the whole set of firms is a union of all these little, of all these little separate continua. Um, each of these input types is associated with a set of essential, sorry, each of these um, product types is associated with a set of inputs that you really need to make it, like brakes and computers here are needed to make airplanes. For any given um, firm here or variety, we're gonna give it a depth. So here the depth is two because there are two steps of, of production here before you get to a layer where no disruptable sourcing is needed. You could think of that as just raw materials or you could think of it as people who can buy their stuff as commodities and they don't need to worry about specific relationships with other firms to source. Um, and of course, it, I've drawn you one tree. In real life, we're gonna have a whole distribution of depths. Uh, some, some firms are gonna have a supply chain of depth two, some are gonna have depth 10, and mu is a distribution saying how many of each are there. For simplicity, you can just think of a one parameter family like Poisson or something, and we're gonna be interested in, formally, we're gonna be studying limits when supply chains get deep. Practically speaking, what I'm interested in is like supply chains of depth 10, 15, that kind of depth. Um, any, I, someone unmuted, I think, any questions? No, okay. So this dotted line picture I've sketched is the potential supply network. It's, a, it's formally a graph on a continuum of firms, all of these firms that I told you about, and the links are just basically connecting people to some kind of suppliers that they need. But a little more formally, each firm needs M distinct inputs in order to produce. So it needs some number of distinct um, input types. And one, one important thing that I'll be upfront about, in the illustrative story I'm telling you in the talk, everything is incredibly symmetric. There's a lot of symmetry. In particular, every one of these goods in this picture needs two distinct input types. In general, I can generalize that a lot, okay? But it's gonna, it's very helpful for me to draw simple pictures. So we'll have the symmetry that everybody needs the same number of inputs and everybody has the same number of sourcing opportunities. Here, both of those numbers are two. So the way that you construct the graph is for a given airplane manufacturer, you just draw in some way from this continuum of firms, you know, uh, two uh, brake manufacturers and two computer manufacturers. And of course, they're, they're gonna have depth one less than you. So this is depth two, these guys are depth one. And if a firm has depth zero, it's one of these guys and it needs no specific sourcing, as I said. Now, to create the realized supply network from the, from the potential supply network, we're gonna make each dotted line turn on, be active or effective um, with a probability called X independently. So I'll draw, I'll draw you a picture, okay? So here's the dotted lines as they used to be. And now we're gonna randomly flip coins and with probability X, let these arrows work. Now an arrow from me to you means I can source from you, meaning that like when I send you an order, I actually get back what I hope to get. And um, let's do a little simple experiment and think through which of these firms can actually produce. And in particular, can our airplane be made? That's what we really care about. So one thing I wanna point out is that if we look at this brake manufacturer, look at B2 here, unfortunately, these two 
So the shocks are at the level of links. I want you to think of them as like something to do with shipping, for example, like you, this shouldn't, you know, for Australia, this should be hopefully a plausible example. You were hoping that the ships or the airplanes would come, but unfortunately, you know, they had to give their capacity to other people. So you didn't get, the, these, these guys were not delivered at least on time, okay? So in this time frame, these links are not working. That means that this brake manufacturer can't make the brakes. We turn him red because he doesn't have access to his crucial input G. So he um, is not operational. That's bad news because, so the other, the other link, the, the link to the other brake manufacturer who actually is working um, is disrupted, right? Because this, this, this link isn't working. And so this link isn't working. This brake manufacturer has no brakes. So unfortunately, because brakes are essential, um, airplane can't be made. That's a story. So um, more, a little more formally, to be functional, a firm needs at least an, an operational link to at least one supplier of each necessary input. And as we've done in this little example, we determine functionality inductively from upstream. And the outcome that we focus on is the share of functioning firms, which we call the reliability of the supply network. Now I'll say two things first. Reliability clearly, if so, you know, we drew one particular realization here. You could have done many realizations of the links and asked what fraction of the time is a typical airplane manufacturer working? Of course, the answer to that question will depend on the depth of this production process. If it's deeper, it gets harder for everything to work, right? So, really, the reliability of the whole system or of a typical product depends on X, which is the probability that each link works, as well as mu which is the distribution of depths of these guys. So mu, like you have a, guy, a tree of depth two, another tree of depth three, another tree of depth 37. And the depth depends on, um, the reliability depends on both of those things. Now you might ask a, a different question, which is who cares about reliability? Who cares about the probability that this random airplane manufacturer is working? Well, if you read the paper, we do a lot of, blood, sweat, and tears, and we put a, a standard economy on top of this random graph, random tree that we've created. And um, we when you make totally standard macroeconomic assumptions, you find that um, welfare of the, ultimately welfare in this economy or GDP or whatever you want to call it, is going to be increasing in row in reliability. But basically what all this is, is if you have a model in the background with love of variety, when more firms function, consumer is happier. Consumer likes more firms to be active. Um, and so take, take my word for it that there's nothing, for our purposes, this is just an assumption that higher row is better. And we're going to be interested in what row turns out to be, right? How robust is the economy? And this is the key picture. Um, that what so this is a picture when in this Poisson case when typical depth is something like 10 I think for this picture okay so here as we've what we're going to vary we're going to fix a distribution with average depth 10 and we're going to vary on the x-axis what we call the relationship strength which is the probability that each of these links works and what I'm plotting on the y-axis is reliability which is the probability that a typical producer can, can operate. And as you see, there's this very sharp transition where up until a certain point, it's very hard to produce anything. I mean, the probability of making anything is quite low and then it gets high. And as we in, take the average depth to be higher and higher, the picture in the limit looks like this, okay? So it, it limit, it goes to a, um, something that, that has this, um, you could call it a discontinuity. I'm drawing it as a correspondence because I want the limit, you know, if I took tau to be a thousand, I would have a curve that would be so steep that you couldn't tell it apart from this, right? But technically speaking, it goes up very, very quickly, as quickly as you want from zero up to this positive level R crit. So I call this thing a precipice. We call it, we say that, you know, a way of saying this is that if you're, if you happen to be here where X was just near the precipice, a very small systemic shock to X, making all the links deliver a little less frequently causes a arbitrarily large loss, right? And so that's bad. And in math, and so I'll, I'll put up the proposition in math here, 
that there are two positive numbers. Crucially, you know, R here is positive and typically a big number. So you go from being from having zero production in deep trees when X is a little below something, 0.6 up to being able to produce 80% of the time kind of instantly, that's the precipice. So that's a math fact, okay? I'm gonna stop for a second and um, I'm happy to take questions about what's what's going on here. So Ben, just to, just to clarify something, in, in math talk, is this like a threshold property on like a branching process or something? That's a great question. So. In, I mean, already in classical branching processes, if you just consider a viral process, right, you all you have all these threshold properties, like the emergence of a giant component is already a threshold property. Um, as I'll show you in a moment, I, I wonder if I have this contrast. In fact, I have it here. Okay, so here's a contrast. Here, here are two, these, both of, so what I'm doing here is, remember in my answer to Alex earlier, I said, if you had m equals one, which means one new input at each stage, right? This is, so this is a special case of the model where at each stage, I only need to add one new, it's like an assembly line and you need to bring in just one new part. I could do everything that I told you about and I could plot the picture and the picture looks like this. So these are both, we, we are in the mathematically in the realm of phase transitions and threshold properties of large graphs. But the, what I wanna emphasize is that the complementarity that's, that Alex asked about is actually doing something interesting to the type of transition that we have. It's making it a transition like this where you discontinuously jump up compared to this kinked one where something happens, but it's not nearly as dramatic. Thank you for that question. Thank you. So um, let me explain, this is a pretty, Alex, is it, am I right to think that this is like a reasonably nerdy audience? Am I allowed to do, is it, I'm allowed to do a little, like, like make it get into the theory? I think so. Yes. You're, you're allowed okay. to do whatever you want. And I know that. My, but my, 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 my feeling is that people are nerdy enough. Yes. Okay. Let's do it. So let's, let's, let's understand a little about what's going on here. Okay. So here's what I want to compute. I hope you're curious, you know, why does this picture look weird? Why do you claim it depends on the complementarity? So I will tell you just a tiny bit about how the, the math behind this works. Um, we have, we're gonna, we're gonna look at the world from A1's perspective. We're gonna say it wants to compute ex ante its probability of producing given a certain reliability of its suppliers. So its suppliers have a certain work with probability a half independently, call that R. What's the probability that our, our hero, Mr. A1 here can produce, okay? So we're gonna, um, it turns out there's a formula. You can write a formula. There's nothing, I given the hour talk, I'm not gonna talk, talk through it step-by-step, step, but it's a very nice little elementary probability exercise to write down for yourself, given that each of these guys works independently with probability R, and also your pipe, your link to them has to work, which happens with probability X, right? For you to source from them. What's the probability that you can get at least one working supplier for each of your necessary inputs? That this will give you this formula. Now, what's cool is that we can write, once we have this equation, we can plot that function and we can look at the probability that, you know, we can, on the X axis, we can put this, this R, the probability each of your suppliers is functional. On the y-axis, we can put the probability that you, the sourcer, are functional. And initially, so let's do it like this. If we, so actually, we won't start with a one. We'll actually start with uh, with these guys, the end guys. Well, they're pro they're functional with probability one. They always work just by assumption. If we look at a guy like B two, from our previous example, his probability of working is just going to be obtained by plugging in these guys' reliability one into this function and it's gonna give us a number called, which I call rho tilde. It's just, you, you plug it in, you evaluate the function R at this value. And then if you wanna know what's going on with Mr. A1, you just do that again. You plug in the answer back into your same function because now we're curious when all of these guys work with this probability, what's, what's the probability that, that A1 works? We, pl we plug it back in by reflecting across the 45 degree line and we end up here. And if we wanted to go deeper, we would just keep, this, the number here is actually the, the depth. So this is our depth two guy. If we wanted to do deeper depths, we would just keep applying the same function R 
repeatedly to the output of the last step. Okay, and that gives us a staircase picture or a cobweb picture of the of a kind that I'm sure you might have encountered in some other context. And what it teaches us is that where we're going to converge to as we take depths deeper and deeper is just the largest fixed point of a certain simple real valued function, right? It's going to, if we do this, we're eventually going to come to a reliability where kind of both you and your suppliers have that reliability, which kind of makes sense in a deep tree because you and they are basically in the same kind of position, right? And so the name of the game in understanding the structure of this picture is understanding how this fixed point behaves as we vary parameters of the model. One thing I haven't told you yet is that this red curve depends on x, right? The reliable x was taken as a fixed number here, but as I vary the reliability of every link, that's going to move this relationship around. And so now I can show you. Um, so zooming out, okay, I, we were zoomed in on a little region. In general, this R curve is going to look something like this. And we're going to intersect it with the 45 degree line to find the fixed point. And in order to understand what happens as we vary x, we're going to look at how the whole curve moves around as we vary x. Let me show you that. So, um, so what we have here is an example. I've plotted the whole R curve. And now for a particular value of x, we have this intersection, which is which shows us that the reliable. So here we're plotting for a given x, what's our reliability? Well, here it's high point, you know, almost one. As we reduce x a little bit, this curve shifts down and we have a different fixed point, which we plotted. And as we reduce x further, the fixed point keeps sliding down, right? It keeps sliding down, keeps sliding down. Now at some point, you can see where this is going. The curve is just kind of kissing the 45 degree line. And so right there, we still have these positive fixed points. Everything is good. But at some point here, it's right at x equals 0.51, as it turns out. As we just shift, as we just lose contact, the, fix, the largest fixed point now is suddenly zero. So it falls all the way down to zero. There is no positive fixed point. And for all these lower x's, we get no production. So that's how you generate this sharp drop, which happens in models. You know, if you're, if you've, it's a fun thing to teach to undergraduates. Models of platforms, uh, kind of network externalities in the in the 80s sense, often has has this picture. Here, this picture is coming about for these supply chain reasons. Any questions about this whole story? And where simple, so it, we don't have quite enough time to understand exactly what it is about this curve that makes this phenomenon happen, but maybe at least a tantalizing hint is that if we look at the classic, what it turns out basically the classic branching process case where you only need one input, the curves look different. And therefore, you know, here you lose the fixed point gradually. As you take the curves down, the fixed point slides down gradually to zero rather than rather than falling abruptly as it did in the other example. So this the paper tries to do this more comprehensively, but um, okay. But here's where we, I mean, I'm mindful of Simon's question at the beginning, um, which is. What is it? What is the economics of this? What externalities are you assuming? And so I want to tell you about that now. We let each firm now choose the strength of its links. So up to now, x, the functionality of the links has been an exogenous number that is somehow just given by the, you know, the nature of the world. Now each firm is going to choose, of course, circumstances will still matter for x, but there's going to be an endogenous margin, which we capture in a simple way by letting each firm choose x, of course, at a cost. So formally, what each firm is going to do is choose the probability with which each of the links that it needs in order to source its inputs is going to work. It's going to choose the probability of functioning of each of these input links that it relies on. And so all of the firm's links are going to work with the probability that it chooses. It can even make them work with almost certainty if it wants. But of course, this is going to cost. The firm pays an upfront cost in order to make its links work. And what I want you to think of practically here is investment in management and logistics. So before, before anything happens, the firm hires lawyers to monitor its contracts, supply chain experts to predict shocks and try to get ahead of them. It does things like, and there's a huge sociological literature on this where you know, firms um, 
do a lot of things like you know visiting their suppliers, trying to make it so that they can use relational contracts to overcome non-contractable shocks, right? And so X is that investment. And then if a firm manages to produce, it's going to earn a gross profit, which we write in a very simple kind of reduced form way. If a firm produces, it's going to earn, by the way, Alex, can I ask you, my computer is being a little, is the audio and video working fine from your end? Yeah, all good. There's a slight okay. delay relative to what you're saying in what you're showing, but it's perfectly okay. Maybe I'll just restart just for, for good measure. I'll restart the share. Um, maybe that'll, um, okay. So you can still see it, right? Great. Um, so the profit that you earn when you, so you only get paid when you produce. If you, if you happen to be non-functional this quarter, too bad. You paid your upfront costs and now you make nothing, which is realistic actually. And if you uh, do manage to produce, you're gonna earn, so kappa here is a shifter, which is just a productivity shifter, which we're gonna use to shift around the whole economy, making it uh, more or less productive. And then the second part, G of rho is a gross profit function, which is very simple. It just captures the idea that in one way or another, the gross profit you make when you manage to produce is decreasing in rho, what's rho? It's competitor reliability, the fraction of other firms in your, in, in your sector that are working, okay? So when, other, when there are fewer other, uh, like these airlines, when there are fewer, other, fewer, fewer airlines that are able to fly um, you know, in Australia, the typical airline is going to seize a larger share of the, of the market and maybe charge higher markups. So it's going to make more profits when fewer competitors are, are functioning. And now we're going to analyze, um, you know, two questions. Okay. One is efficiency. Okay. This is a cheap, a cheap trick, but if relation, imagine that a grand social planner is choosing all the investments in the whole economy, all the X's, um, will investment be, if, uh, on the precipice, will it ever happen that outcomes are anywhere near this fragile point? And the answer is no, you can't possibly be here because the derivative of reliability gets infinite in X as you're here. If you're, if you, so if you were just here, the planner could ask everyone to increase X just a tiny bit, that would cost a little bit, but it would have huge at the margin infinite returns if you're anywhere near here. So planner would never be okay with, with reliability anywhere here. And what I'm gonna argue to you is that, so that's kind of, there are two strikes against this point as being economically realistic. One is that it seems like a priori, if you thought of X as exogenous, it seems very, very non-generic, right? What are the chances that you would end up right here? Seem, seems unlikely. And moreover, if someone is choosing the configuration of the economy efficiently, they would never wanna be here either. Nevertheless, I'm going to show you that in equilibrium, due to a wedge, an inefficiency that I discussed with Simon earlier, there's going to be a um, big chunk of parameters where the economy is going to end up somewhere over here. So how the hell is that going to happen? Let's find out. So uh, here's I, the... Yeah. One question. Yeah. Hi. Hey, Don. Um, hey. No cost here to... Um, uh, over uh, over uh, uh, over receiving uh, the same input, so you might think you're, if you're right. no. I'm going to assume I'm going to assume that there's yeah. I'm going to assume that conditional on having the links you source efficient. There's not there's you're not going to have like twice the inputs and have to throw some away. I'm assuming away that inefficiency. So conditional. I don't know. Is that what you're asking? I'm assuming conditional yeah. on conditional it's on the unusual then choose the. So you would always have too much incentive then to invest in X's even among your individual suppliers if you never face a cost from getting too much of one particular input. Ah, that's a great question. That's a great, okay. It depends on this gross profit function because here's the thing, when I invest, I enable all the people downstream, downstream of me, all the people who rely on me to produce. So even though it's true for me, I invest, you're right that there's never, I never over invest sort of, uh, sorry, under invest for myself, but because my production also enables all sorts of other production, which I don't get all the rents from, I might still under invest by the social planners lights, right? 
the, the social planner might want me to invest more for the sake of the people downstream of me uh, who need my stuff. Now that means that they should be willing to pay me to invest more. And that's the key. So now to be precise about the friction that Simon wanted to know about. The friction is that my downstream users can't pay me directly for increasing my X. Because if they could, they would want to subsidize my X investment because they benefit. I do enough for myself, but they'd like me to do even more for them. And they can't pay me for, because for, I guess in the model, it's not possible. And how I think of that re really is that it's not contractable. You can't pay me to have dinner with my, with, my, with my suppliers, to be up in the middle of the night worrying about. There's certain parts of this. The contracts are relational. That's the story. So let me stop and see if, that, if that's acceptable to you. Yeah, I'll keep on thinking about it. But, so it's it's your your you having that. Let me just make sure I've got the model correctly. Then uh, you have that investment is in the downstream link, not in the upstream link. You, sorry. So when when I invest, I invest in the links working to people I source from. So it's the links that I need. So here, airplane manufacturer is paying for the links to work in for computers. But okay, here airplane is the most downstream, but also computer guy is paying for his links to these guys. And airplane guy likes him, you know, likes when he does that, but probably wants him to pay even more. At least that's what we're gonna, you know, that's that's the inefficiency that we're gonna see. Okay, thanks. Good, thank you. Other questions? Um, can I ask a quick question? I can. Hi, um, so, um, yeah, so, like once uh, I have, uh, I'm able to produce, then uh, does this model imply that uh, uh, I'm indifferent between having one working uh, production line versus like multiple, like two or more like a working like um, uh, production lines? Very good question. Yes. Yeah. So this is assuming exactly this in, it's assuming that once you have one working link, you can produce, there's no capacity constraint is a way to write as you, there's, and so that it's not obvious which way that assumption is just so we can, we made it for tractability, but as I think you're anticipating, if you got further incremental returns from having two of them working, even when, when one works, it would actually improve your incentives to, in, to invest in them working, right? It would, because you would get something extra when two work. So while I don't think that could that would overcome all the externalities, it would certainly change the model. And we're just for simplicity assuming it away. It's it's an important point that you made. Um, Thanks. So um, I'm going to tell you, and this is the last the the main result that I want to leave you with is that when we model, so I call this network formation, okay? That may be a kind of fancy way to, to say this, but I, I do think of investing in X as choose, choosing a parameter that determines the, um, you know, uh, probability that links form. So it's a kind of poor man's network formation choice. And we're gonna study the equilibrium outcome of that choice. So the row curve is the physics, physical curve that you've been seeing. And I'm going to superimpose on it a best, a best response curve, which is, um, you should think about it like this. Imagine that all your counterparties are working with probability rho. So every, everyone that I rely on works 70% of the time then I get to choose X. Of course, I have these costs. And so I get to decide how much I invest in my, my links working. And so I'm going to choose some best response X, and that's going to give me a point on this curve. Uh, it's not obvious what the shape of this curve is. Some things are kind of obvious, like when all of my suppliers are really terrible and never manage to produce, then I, why am I investing in any X at all? It doesn't make sense to invest in X because I'll never get anything for it. So actually, it probably should be flat around here for a while. And then if all of my suppliers are very reliable, probably my incentives are kind of decreasing around there because the better they are, you know, I shouldn't work too hard to make my links perfect because even one link will be enough, right? And it has some kind of shape. So it's not obvious what the shape is, but one thing that is true is as I move around kappa, as I move around the productivity of the economy or the, the kind of productivity shifter that makes everybody's profits higher, as I make kappa lower, 
everybody's going to have worse incentives to invest because of course they make less, you know, it's just a simple monotonicity. So now look at this. So at some point, this curve, as I reduce kappa, this curve is at some point going to come and start and the, oh, and by the way, we make an equilibrium selection. So the equilibrium we're interested in is the, is the higher one, which turns out to be the efficient one. And focusing on this equilibrium, after the best response curve first touches this, um, you know, this, this start of the precipice, after we, when we then move it beyond it, there are gonna be all these points in between of intersection where the equilibrium, where the two curves intersect, is right on the precipice, right over here. So in, in a sense, all that's going on here is the fact that this precipice is vertically thick, vertically has positive area, means that when I do some kind of economics and I inter intersect some other economic curve here, the, the best response curve, there's going to be a positive measure of equilibria that wind up right on that precipice, right? So formally, there is an interval of kappas, of productivities, such that for all the kappas in that interval, the undominated equilibrium, the efficient equilibrium, is arbitrarily close to the precipice. Um, and you know, before we get there, here the equilibrium is nice and productive and um, not, not on the precipice. And then once we get low enough, you just can't produce anything. There's no equilibrium where positive production happens. So that economy is in bad shape. So here, here you can't make anything. Here you can make, here there's no fragility, no criticality. But for this positive chunk of kappas, you're going to be right on the precipice in equilibrium. What does that mean? When you're right on the precipice, you're going to be fragile. So let me be a little more formal about that. If when we were investing, we were counting on a certain kind of production function for X, for, for reliability, and I was like, okay, I'll invest this much, I'll invest $1,000, and I'll get my X of 0.7. And now COVID comes, and it doesn't have to cause a big harm, but it's going to cause all of the investments we were hoping to get to be a little less than what we were you know, counting on. So um, relationship strengths end up being X minus epsilon rather than the X we wanted. Then, well, if we were right here, then that little damage to X is going to knock us all the way down. By the way, it doesn't have to be unanticipated. Even when, even when this small shock, small, small shock that happens with small probability is fully internalized and anticipated by everyone, you're still going to have all the same results. And these, this little shock, when it comes, is going to destroy, in this, in this stark example I'm doing, all the pro production capability of the economy. It's going to kill the economy. So kill this production network. So that's the, any questions about this result? Sorry, just a clarification, maybe. When, when you say all relationship strengths being X or the shock, then they would uh, perturbate around X. Uh, essentially, you are choosing one level of strength for all those relationships once and for all. Is that, is no, that it? You're right. No, this is imprecise. What I meant, you're right. What I meant is, I mean, here, you know, each in the model, each firm has its own investment technology. And so, what I'm assuming here is that basically the whole the technology is shocked for everyone. So whatever choice you made, you're going to get epsilon less than that. Um, oh. Now, we're studying symmetric equilibria. So of course, in equilibrium, it's symmetric. But a priori, it could be whatever. It need not be. Yeah, OK. All right. And um, maybe something else, but maybe you're going to talk about that later. It just occurred to me, is there a rationale here for building in, by design, redundancies, actually? Great point. Um, to say more, say more about what you mean. Yeah. So, in some sense, you know, here the yeah about the possible paths and you know pursue more redundancies in terms of possible paths to obtain the all the inputs that you are required to have. I mean, in right. principle, if all were perfectly reliable, one would be sufficient one path. But because of these per possible perturbations, disruptions, then you would, you know, the, the question is, can you, you is given the network, but what if you had also choice as to how much you branch out and to build redundancies by design? Yeah, that's a great- you want to think about or? That's a great question. So, I mean, at some level in the model, right, the fact that everybody has N potential sourcing opportunities for its stuff is, is some, is redundancy and you're, you're quite right. I mean, one natural thing this makes me want to do is say, well, maybe we should we should have, and in fact, this is something that governments are talking about this, and maybe we can create databases and registries and help firms find alternate mm -hmm. suppliers, 
So that increases um, in the model, increases this n, this number of potential inputs. Holding x fixed, um, that, could, that clearly only helps. That's going to make this curve higher. For any level of x, it's going to make everyone more reliable. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you make investment endogenous, I don't know the answer. It's a good question. We should work out some yeah. examples. I just I yeah. oh, go ahead, sorry. It's just something that was I thought it was interesting and I wonder whether you're gonna talk about it later, but yeah. Yeah, I, I don't have any I think you could get a result where in, increasing there could be a perverse effect on the equilibrium where if you make mm -hmm. everyone more reliable in equilibrium, you could get less investment. I haven't worked it out, but I, I really yeah. appreciate the question. Thank you. Um, so let me I'm gonna um find my way back to where we were. So Alex, I'm kind of I'm in a position, I can stop on the hour. Um, how do you do it? Do you, um, should I should I aim for that? that? That's probably best, but. Great. You know, if, if you need more time, that's also fine. I might, more I time know. And, and people who have to leave will just do so. Yeah, of course, they, you know, I'm, I, so let, let me just wrap up, okay? So, you know, one thing you could do, which actually relates a little bit to Simona's question, it's a little bit, it's a different margin of comparative statics. You could, I told you the model for one supply network. In the whole economy, you have a continuum of supply networks or a large number of them with all sorts of stuff going on. If you think of Kappa arbitrarily as being fixed for now and you have all these M's and N's out there, then you know one thing you could do is look at how this picture of, of the bad region of Kappa looks as you vary M, which is the number, the, number of complementary inputs. So if you have only two inputs here for this example I've worked, um, you're not at risk of, you're not even going to be on the precipice. For the intermediate complexity inputs, like things that require four or seven simultaneous inputs, they're going to be in the fragile regime. And then actually, once you get to really complicated things, you can't make them at all. The equilibrium doesn't support, you know, there's no equilibrium that supports them. And so you could start doing you know, people ask us, oh, is your view that the economy really collapses, you know, uh, following a shock like a COVID shock? Of course not. That's not what we think. We think that there is lots of different supply networks operating under different circumstances. And our theory gives you a strong force of amplification where a small shock can be a very big deal to a chunk of them. And it's a chunk that you can systematically sort of characterize as being of intermediate complexity. Um, the guys that are that are sort of in okay shape, not not great um, are the ones that they, they can function, but they're very susceptible to these shocks are gonna be ones that are, are sort of at the frontier of the complexity that the economy can produce. Um, I'm gonna skip uh, a related paper. So I'll just leave this up as we, in the last two minutes. Um, so what do I wanna say? I've talked about the market failure. You just can't sell robustness directly. If firms could contract on and sell X, how much they invest, it would be a different world. So if you think firms are great at building reputation for having strong supply links, then you should think the world is less inefficient than the story I told you. If you think relational contracts and the inability to perfectly commit is a big deal, you should be maybe worried about these inefficiencies. Um, but the externality is what the Simon asked about is, you know, we've tried to think about contractual improvements. And the basic issue is that especially around the precipice, when I become more robust, I help a lot of other firms. And unless I can take all their profits, you know, due to my marginal investment, I won't have quite enough incentives to do that. Um, in financial networks, similarly too, people often ask, oh, won't contracts fix all this? Maybe, but it's kind of hard to write fully contingent, complete contracts over these kinds of, in these complex networks although it's something that market design folks are very interested in, I'm very interested in, but you know, insofar as there is a wedge, it interacts in an interesting way with these forces. Um, I'll, let me just close on a methodological note, okay? In this model, firms make smooth choices. They choose X and that results in random networks and we can analyze expected functionality probabilities rather than trying to analyze exactly some ex post network. We don't have to deal with all the usual complexities of analyzing a fixed graph because we're generating a random graph, right? Um, this was a question that was asked earlier, a random graph with some parameters. And when we endogenize probabilities rather than links as Matt Jackson and friends did 30 years ago, um, we end up with models that are very interesting. Um, 
that let us use real random graph theory, but that look a lot more like economics that we can do like, you know, we can differentiate things, we can look at smooth kind of intersections of curves. And so I think there's some opportunity there for talking about some of these issues and models that look a little bit more like search models, but have some of the networky complexity coming from the complementarities that Alex asked about at the very beginning. So that's what I had for you. I will um, officially stop and I'm very grateful for your time and your questions. All right, well, thank you so much. I'll stop the recording now.